While the antinatalist ideology cannot possibly be taken seriously, I am quite willing to accept that many of the people who have been suckered into this cult, who have been suckered into adopting this value judgment of antinatalism, are themselves in fact sincere, that they are genuine in their concern about the state of reality, and that they are arguing from a position of empathy. I'm not denying that, and I'm not dismissing that or belittling it in any way, shape or form. The problem with the philosophy, if you must call it that, is that it is employing a fallacious line of logic, a fallacious line of reasoning, to arrive at a conclusion that is therefore absurd and must be rejected out of hand. The antinatalists, of course, who have emotionally invested in this ideology, who have emotionally invested in calling themselves antinatalists, see this, see this rejection of their so-called philosophy on logical grounds or any other sort of objection like that, as a rejection of their sincerity, as a rejection of their Statement, statement that they are arguing from a position of empathy. And that is simply not the case. Nobody is arguing that you are not being empathetic, that you aren't sincere when you look at the pain and suffering that sentient beings are enduring the world. What is incorrect is the logic that you have applied to this situation and the solution that you are presenting. And I've explained this in previous videos in which I've talked about the concept, the big context switcheroo that is happening within the antinatalist argument. That's one very strong argument against the philosophy. And the second argument is the argument of hypothetical Harry. Look it up if you want to know. So that's one thing. The other thing is sloppy definitions, so to speak. Sloppy equivocation of terms that seem on the face of it to be very similar but in fact aren't and the terms that I'm talking about in particular in this case are terms such as for example harm and suffering. Now harm and suffering seem to be very similar ideas, very similar concepts but they aren't and the antinatalist position towards harm and suffering towards all this negativity is incorrect as well. For example, the antinatalist would look at problems such as harm and suffering and state that they are inherent to the universe if it consists, if it contains sentience. That is nonsensical, of course. The problem is that suffering, for example, is an experience, is a personal subjective interpretation of sensations that a sentient being undergoes. In other words, as a sentient being, you will have a number of experiences during your lifetime, and if you, experiencing those experience, experiences, if you consider any of those experiences to be negative, then you would consider yourself to be suffering. Harm is a very different thing to suffering. Harm is a state of being. So, what harm is, is an inability of the organism to function normally, function in the way that it has become accustomed to, for example. And if you take those two different explanations, then first of all you can see that harm and suffering are two very different things, and also that the approaches to harm and suffering are very different as well. Suffering, for example, is not something that should be avoided. Suffering is a prompt to the organism, to the sentient being, that action is required. That is what suffering is. You are feeling suffering, you are feeling pain, discomfort, 
some sort of malaise. What that indicates to you is that you need to do something. You need to take that hand off the red hot plate. You need to get yourself out of that embarrassing situation. You are suffering until you take action to address your suffering. Harm, so suffering, let me finish this, suffering is not something that needs to be avoided, that needs to be prevented. Suffering, that is something that needs to be addressed when it occurs. The opposite of it, or the, the converse of this, is harm. And harm can be the result of suffering. Harm can happen if suffering is endured and the appropriate action is not taken, or the appropriate action cannot be taken for whatever reason. For example, if you are suffering from terminal cancer and you're suffering pain from that, then you are suffering and whatever action, you know, the required action to end the suffering is to get rid of the cancer, but that option is not open to you because your cancer is too far advanced or whatever and you cannot do anything about it. Harm is when you are no longer able to function normally within the constraints that you are accustomed to. So, for example, it is normal for me not to be able to go outside the door and jump onto the roof of my house because I simply cannot jump that high. So, I am not harmed as a result of not being able to do that. However, I should be able to go outside and jump onto the little wall that's about that high, that's fencing off the boundary of my garden. And if I break a leg, then I will no longer be able to do that. And then I've been harmed. But that immediately suggests that harm, again, is something that isn't just a permanent state of being. Harm is something that can be addressed. For example, say you become paralyzed. You can no longer walk. At that moment, you have been harmed. You are no longer able to function normally. However, you then adapt to that situation. You adapt to the harm that has befallen you. You start dealing with the fact that you cannot walk. You get a wheelchair. You accept that the constraints, the limits of what you can do within reality, have been set differently to what they used to be. And then within those new constraints that you now face, you start living your life again. Creating new purpose for yourself, new meaning for yourself, new goals to achieve, and so on and so forth. And harm, therefore, is something that can, in principle, possibly be overcome. Once you've achieved that, the harm has been eliminated. It's gone. And that's why, for example, we can get such situations as the photograph that Andy and Akantavad were showing in one of his video of the lady who was sitting in a wheelchair and laughing at the camera. She has overcome whatever harm she has been subjected to and she has been able to deal with that. Of course, the ultimate harm, some people might say, is the fate that awaits all of us and that is the harm of dying. But that is in actual fact not true. Remember what I said, that harm is a state of being. And a state of being requires your existence. Death is not a state of being. Death is a cessation of being. So in actual fact, death cannot cause any harm. It does not leave you, the sentient being, in a state in which you can no longer function normally. Death means you cease to exist. No sentient being has therefore ever been harmed, has ever been subjected to harm, has ever been traumatized, that's another good word, traumatized, by its own death. No matter how horrible a sentient being's death may have been, the being does not emerge from it 
harmed or traumatized, it simply does not emerge from it. And starting to realize such subtle but important nuances about what harm is and what suffering is also blows the whole antenatalist argument out of the water completely. It reduces it to absurd bickering about value statements and personal opinions. And again, that is one of the main reasons why the only response that this so-called philosophy deserves is ridicule, because nothing else is worth my effort. Except maybe this video.